Hi there, my name is Sean Stevens, uh, and I'm an entrepreneur. You can tell that, of course, because I'm wearing a suit and I have crazy hair. That's how you tell us apart. Um, my own personal definition of an entrepreneur is usually broke. Uh, that's not really a good a definition of an entrepreneur. In fact, a better definition would be that where most people live their lives inside uh, the frameworks that other people have created, inside other people's canvases, uh, and they're creative within that, and they live their lives that way, entrepreneurs tend to think or like to think outside of the box. In fact, I don't even believe there is a box. I think the box is a lie. I believe that there are these great ideas that became frameworks, that became conventions, that became traditions, that became rules, that then became bureaucracy, and then became truth. And we believe them to be true, but they are not necessarily true. Let me give an example of this. A great example is the world map. When you go to your mind palace, you think about the map. Canada's always in the top left-hand corner. And Africa's always at the bottom underneath everybody else. Why can't Africa be on top of everybody else? Why does Europe always have to be at the center? This is a big lie. The world is a sphere. We should be able to look at the world in different ways. Here's another example. Uh, if you go anywhere in the world, I always get stuck at airports, and I'm trying to think, what, what is the prongs that fit in so I can plug in my laptop when I get to this country? Because all of these different frameworks arose at different times throughout the whole world for electricity. And yet, there is one that when I go around the world, and I can plug in my phone into anywhere. The reality is there are now frameworks on top of frameworks that are anachronistic. I'll give you another example of a, of a framework that makes me crazy. When I go out, and I'm not talking about the, when I think about cars, usually people think about the difference between gas cars and electric cars. But if you go outside in the parking lot and look at all the cars, they're all exactly the same. I mean, they're just slightly bent differently on the outside. Now, as legend has it, the reason why roads are the width they are and cars are two people wide and two people deep is because the Romans, thousands of years ago, this is a legend, I think, uh, but they built the roads, the original roads, and there had to be two Romans, one to drive the chariot and one to shoot at people. So the reason why cars that we use today are the way they are is because of the width of Roman butts. It doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? There's another framework. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone here has played the game of life. This is life. So the way this game works is you start the game in a little car, of course, and you start going and you have two choices. You can either go right and go to university and get one type of job, or you can go left and not get a job and get there faster. And then, of course, you keep going and you have to stop and you have to get married to somebody from the opposite gender. And then you keep going and you know good things happen and bad things happen. You throw some children in the car. And then you get to the end of your life or at the end of the game. And whoever has the most money and the biggest house wins the game. Does that sound like a smart framework to you guys? If you take a thousand therapists and you put them all in a room, they will all tell you the same thing. Money does not make you happy. Now, lack of money might make you unhappy, but that's completely different. It's connected, though, because what people do is they're trying to win the game of life, and they go and they get themselves a huge house, and that means they don't have any money because they're living beyond their means. And, of course, they're not happy. It doesn't make sense. There are these great ideas that became conventions, that became rules, that became truth, and we believe them, but they are not necessarily true. Now, I have this little company called TreeFrog, and uh, people come to me all the time, and they say, this, you've got such an innovative company, it's amazing. And I uh, guess because there are all these innovation artifacts, I call them. So you go in and you see all my crazy people, I call them the frogs, and uh, you, you'll see that there's all these cool spaces in my business. There's, you can, there's rooms that you can do meetings in and glass rooms and open areas and training rooms and there's skateboards that everybody are riding everywhere. And the walls are covered in paint that you can write on so anyone has a good idea, they can just write them down. And of course, there's desks that go up and down you can move around so everybody's comfortable. And of course, there's, we bring in trainers from all over the world to teach us stuff every week. We're constantly learning, constantly learning. And of course, we have theater events and poetry readings and we have a, a robotics clubs and we have a room that you can do YouTubes in. We have a nap room in case you get tired. We've got an electric car you can borrow in case you need to go somewhere during the day. And we've got a beer tap. You know, all of these things, though, they're not innovative. They're just creative. Innovation is about really rethinking outside of the box. 
And there are these great ideas that became conventions, that became rules, and we believe them to be true, but they are not necessarily true. One example of this is that businesses exist for profit. We've all heard this before, we know this, right? This is why businesses exist. And a hundred years ago, somebody had this great idea that they were going to make a product or a service and line a bunch of people up so they could make that thing. And around that, they were going to build operations. And then around that, they were going to get salespeople to go out and sell stuff. And then you had to sell as many possible things as you could. And out of this came profit. Profit, that's the name of the game, right? Well, see, I thought this is a stupid idea. So I said, instead, I want to start with an idea. I want to start with the idea that I want to help people genuinely be successful. And then, I also want to do re remarkable, excellent things in my life. I want to be proud of what I do. And also, I want to actually do things differently. And around that, I'm going to find people that want to be with me on that voyage, that want to do stuff with me. And then around that, I'm going to go find people that I can genuinely help. Because if I can help them, I, I have meaning in my life. And then around that, then I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do. Sounds bizarre, doesn't it? Out of this comes profit. And here's the thing, profit isn't a bad word. It's just that profit is like breathing. You, it shouldn't be the reason you exist. It's necessary, but it shouldn't be your focus. On top of profit, I also want to make sure that everybody that works with me is happy and successful and that their families are happy and successful. And on top of that, I want to make sure that our clients, the people we do work for, we're not just selling stuff for the sake of selling. If they can get something done better elsewhere, I say, please go there. I, just, I want to help you. I, I want you to be successful. And on top of that, I want to make sure that we don't damage the environment, that we do everything we can to help the world. And on top of that, I genuinely want to help my local area, my local community, and the national community, and the international community. And the thing is, all of these things have to stay in balance. We all know that if you're profiting at the expense of the environment, that leads to very bad things. But what about if you are hurting the people you work with for the sake of the community? That doesn't make sense. Or hurting the community for the sake of your people. You, it's really hard to keep all of these things in balance, but it's necessary. And I believe it, it brings more meaning to business. I believe there are these great ideas that became conventions, that became truths, and they are not necessarily true. Another big lie that I'm always reigning at is the idea of work-life balance. I think this is a stupid idea. A hundred years ago, somebody came up with the idea. It was great. They were all standing around and somebody said, I think it's inappropriate that kids should have to work 16 hours a day. Everyone kind of humbly agreed with them. They said, hey, let's only make them work 12 hours a day. That sounds fair. And somebody else put up their hand and said, why don't we actually split the day into three different pieces? Eight hours of work, eight hours of play, eight hours of, uh, of sleep. That makes sense. That's 24 hours, right? But because of this whole little framework that we have where we're, you're going to have a white picket fence way over here, which is very far away from your actual place you work, you're going to actually have to drive back and forth, right? And we're going to squish the best part of the day in the middle of the day where, you know, so you're going to have to play on either side. And of course, because everybody's driving back and forth at the exact same time of the day, 9 to 5, everyone's going to fight at the grocery line at the end of the day. That only leaves you with an hour or so at the end of the day to fall asleep in your armchair so you can stumble to work the next day. This is a stupid idea. Would you not agree? Here's the thing. This the whole idea is premised on one simple thing that I hear from CEOs, which is, Work is supposed to suck. You get paid for it to suck. That's what the money is for. This is a stupid idea. And here's the thing, it's easily fixable. So one of the things that I did to fix this is I said, look, we're not going to put our business in the middle of Toronto where it's hard and expensive. We're, we're going to put it at the outskirts of town so it's easier for people to find a place to live. And if people don't live who apply to work at, at, at our place, we're going to have them move. It's not that hard. And if, and if it's difficult because their spouse is working or something, we'll, we'll help them move their spouse or help them move their family. And it doesn't make sense for everybody to start at nine. That, that's ridiculous. Which some people should start at 11, some people start at eight. You know, start whenever is good for you based on your family and what your needs are. And in fact, it's ridiculous that everybody goes shopping on Saturday morning. Why don't, why don't some people go shopping on Tuesday morning, save you an hour standing in line, and then maybe work an hour on Saturday instead. Blend your life together. This whole nine to five thing is just is hurting us, it's not helping us. I believe though there are these great ideas that became conventions, that became truth, and they are not necessarily true. 
Here's another one. Uh, the idea that retirement is the goal. And here's the thing is 100 years ago, the idea was that because your life was going to suck while you worked, then you get to the end, if you live to be 60 or 65, you'll spend the last few years playing golf, right? Now, here I am in a group of people who will likely live to be 150 years old. That's for another TED Talk. But if you retire at 65 years old, you're going to have to play golf for 85 years. That is my own personal hell, I have to tell you. My grandfather worked, uh, this was a big moment for me. I gr my grandmother, grandfather worked until he was 86 years old. He was a dentist. Admittedly, it was getting a little scary near the end there, but... <laughs> but the fact is, when I was 30, I realized, you know what, I've got at least 50 more years, possibly even 100 years to work. Why would I concentrate on a th building a business or doing a thing for one or two years? Why don't I think about my whole life, about 50 years, and try and do something amazing in that period of time? And in fact, instead of just creating a 50-year plan for my business, if I really care about the environment and I really care about the people I work with, why wouldn't I make sure that their families are looked after, their kids are looked after? So why don't I create a business that's going to last a thousand years and start thinking about what does that mean? But here's the catch is that, that we, did, we are now doing things. When I, went to, when I went to school, none of the things that we do at my company were things that you could get trained for, except maybe the receptionist. Everybody else is doing something different. And in another 20 years, we're going to have to relearn everything we're doing. So how could we possibly come up with that thing? And instead, I said, let's just have a way of doing things. Let's actually sit down and say, what is the best way we could possibly do things? And what would make us happiest as a group? And then let's do that for a thousand years. There are these great ideas that became conventions, that became rules, that became truth, and they are not true. Another one is, you need a career. You know, I, I hear this all the time, and I remember a, a guidance counselor once told me, you know, you kind of have a choice, you're going to be a nurse, or you're going to be an IT guy, and you kind of have to figure that out ahead of time. But you guys already know, that's not how the world works anymore. And the idea that there will be doctors in 50 years, that might actually be, I mean, there will always be people who help other people get better, but that's not necessarily, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to be doctors. And the, and, and the idea that you're going to have this one giant job, career thing all throughout your life is ridiculous. Instead, why don't you figure out what you're passionate about and you love and then go figure out how to educate and gain training and gain skills around that idea. And once you know what you love and you can build on that, then actually you're building a theme for your life, not a career, and you're going in the direction of happiness and making money. There are these great ideas that became conventions and we believe them to be true, but they are not true. Another one is employees should be loyal. I hear this all the time from CEOs. Stupid kids, they can't keep a job. You know, there's all this unemployment for kids. But that's not because kids are stupid. That's because companies are stupid. You know, a general many years ago, General Patton, he said, the problem with leadership is that leadership is always about how the people at the bottom should be loyal to the people at the top, when really the people at the top should be loyal to the people at the bottom. But if you go through business books and, and they teach you business skills, they'll tell you the goal of a business is to get some funding and grow as, as big as you possibly can in as short a period of time as you can. And again, we have a thousand people, you sell it to IBM, and then everybody gets fired. And that's a brilliant way for a business to exist. Or alternatively, this is a great business theory, is every year fire the worst 20% of the people working at your business because they're just not working hard enough. What, so somebody can't have a bad year or a bad day, or somebody's doing something they shouldn't be doing, you can't just move them to do something else? Here's the thing, I think this is a stupid idea. So I said, you know what, I love this idea of a thousand years, I want everybody at my company to work there for a thousand years, and I'm going to invest everything I can into us, and we're all going to work together to try and achieve things together. And here's the interesting thing is, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I went through this, this period where I made some really bad decisions as a CEO. And, uh, and I was trying to be a little too innovative, and I spent more money than I should have on a couple of things that were really neat, but they didn't make any money. And I reached a point where, actually, I ran out of money. The company ran out of money, and uh, we weren't going to be able to continue. And so I did all the math, and I realized I'm going to have to do something. And I pulled everybody together into a room, and I said, look, I, I know this is completely against what I've been saying, but I'm going to have to fire one out of every five of you because we just don't have the money to do it. 
And so the people actually got together, and, and they came back to me, and they said, you know what? We are going to volunteer as a company, everybody in the whole company, to take a 20% pay cut so that we can all stay. And some other people said, you know what? I've been working here for a long time, and I have money. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put my check in a drawer. Because, and, and you, I'll just cash it when you're, the company gets back up on its feet. And some other people said, you know, we don't want to harm the other people we're working with. We want to make sure they're okay. So they went out and paid the company's bills for us. Five weeks later, everybody returned to, five, to full salary. And a year later, everything was back to normal. Everybody had been paid back. And nobody lost their job. There are these great ideas that became conventions, that became rules, that became truth. And we all believe them, but they are not true. Another one I hear is, it's hard to find good people. People just don't work hard. They don't work like they used to. And this is back to this, but this is because companies are, are just, they're, they're using the old ideas and they're not rethinking them in the context of the new world. Why can't they just think a little differently? And so I just simply changed a few things about the way I approach things. And I'm still, I mean, the idea of just constantly challenging, constantly changing the things that we do. And you know what? Here's the, here's the impact of that. We, we are a little tiny company. We have 35 people, but a year ago we had 30. Last year, we hired five people. And we went out to the world and we said, hey, is anybody interested in working at TreeFrog? And 5,000 people applied. That's 1,000 people for every job we had. And that's because I think, because there are these great ideas that became conventions, that became rules, that became truth, and we all believe them, but they are not true. And we said, let's change the way we are as a business. So I built a business, TreeFrog, which is a company that I want to work at, and I want to genuinely work there for the rest of my life, and I hope that the people that I'm working with are there too for the rest of their lives. And I genuinely have this idea of lasting for a hundred years, maybe even a thousand. And I'm not suggesting that we should burn all of the ideas that exist and all the frameworks to the ground. It's, this is not about rebellion. It's about rethinking. It's about working better. It's about saying, does that framework that is there, does it make sense anymore? We don't have to throw it out, but is there another way we could do it? I think together with this group, we could rethink all of those frameworks and we'd have a better world. Thank you very much.